It's time for another podcast by George. Straight talk, straight from the heartland, that'll have you saying, by George, I think he's got it. Now, here's George. Hello, hi, how are you? Welcome on in to another podcast by George. Back to doing what I like to do. And one of the things about the podcast is I get to cover the what I consider to be the significant news of the day, and I get to cover things uh, my way. I get to um, put in a little humanity to it once in a while, which I think is sorely missing in today's uh, narratives and dialogue that we get from uh, corporate media in particular. And I came across a story uh, here this past week, and I said to myself, my God, I just got to tell this tale. So we're going to get to that. Joining us on the podcast by George Liveline today is Alexandra Neal. And before we get to Alex, I I just kind of wanted to background this a a little by talking about the coronavirus. And, you know, I've been telling people that I think at times I get depressed. I I tell them we're totaled. We're TDL. We're too dumb to live is what I tell people because I, I look at what's going on and I've been telling people on the podcast that if we don't social distance better, if we don't wear masks, if we don't do what we're supposed to do, and if they don't get a vaccine by Christmas time, folks, they're going to be stacking people up like cordwood. I mean, we cannot do what we're doing now when the weather turns cold, everybody moves indoors, and, and we hunker down for the winter time. Things are going to get really bad. And just here where I live in the great Midwest, they shut down the bars and they put restrictions on them. The local paper went out. Now nah, they're not paying any attention to those local restrictions. People aren't social distancing. They're sitting butt cheek to butt cheek on bar stools. Bartenders aren't wearing masks. People are supposed to be in these uh, bar restaurants to get food. Now nah, they're just serving them the same drinks that they always do. Maybe you saw the news article about the COVID spread out of Sturgis, South Dakota, maybe being as far and as reaching as 250,000. Now it's a mathematical calculation. But my God, I look at that and think, why are we doing this kind of stuff? Is Sturgis worth infecting 250,000 people with the modern day plague? But before we get to Alex, I probably have got the best personal account of this that that I've that you can imagine. Here where I live, they host the National Super Modified Riding Lawnmower Race Championships. Do you think that they called those off in the pandemic? No. They had them. <laughs> I'm not kidding, folks. They've got a they got a heliport for this thing. I've seen a satellite truck down there at this track for the super modified national riding lawnmower races. They come from all over the country. Hell, they may come from all over the world to do that. And that's what we're doing. So anyway, that's just my opening thoughts on the coronavirus. And it's going to dovetail a little bit, get into the story that we're going to talk about uh, today uh, with uh, Alex Neal, a first-time guest, a new friend of podcast by George. Alex is 22, 21 years old. She lives in Redding, California. And I saw this article in USA Today. I'll just read the uh, first couple of paragraphs, and that'll get us into it. It says, in the months since her father died from coronavirus, a Redding woman says she's been called everything from a liar to a sensationalist, perpetuating a misinformation campaign. When Mark Neal, her father, lost his battle with the virus in April... Alex posted on social media and told people in person he died. Since that time, calls and comments from those who believe the virus is a hoax have made dealing with her grief more difficult. And I I thought, my God, I got to get her on the podcast and I got to show my support and share her story. Alex, welcome to a podcast by George. Thank you for having me. You know, this Facebook thing, my podcasts are on Facebook. It's uh, Facebook. It's actually one of my more popular uh, platforms. And I see all the time what you're talking about on Facebook. Um, but it sounds like it isn't just what you've encountered anyway, isn't just limited to Facebook. Right, right. It's very, it goes from Facebook to in person, you name it. <laughs> You know, and I tell people on Facebook as an example, and of course I put the podcast out there and I post little snippets and stories and stuff. If I'm making a statement, particularly on my personal Facebook page, I'm not looking for trolls, certainly, but I'm not even looking, I'm not looking for an argument. I'm making a statement. 
it's my Facebook page, my wall, as they used to call it. It's my home on the internet. So if you like it, go ahead and indicate so, but it's just there as a statement. Now, if I'm asking a question, that's a different matter. Okay, then that means I'm looking for a response. Weigh in with your response, but it just takes a little bit of common sense and a little bit of civility to make the platform usable, beneficial, and enjoyable for everyone, but it can, at the same time, can make it horrifically miserable for uh, people like you. Well, that's that's that angle of this story, but let's get to, to the story about your father. Now, I mentioned that a little bit at the beginning, because I still encounter people that, that don't believe, that they think this is ginned up. They, they think that it's exaggerated, that the coronavirus is a hoax, but you know all too well uh, that this is a real thing and uh, just uh, causes heartache and tragedy uh, in people's lives uh, like uh, you can't believe. Tell us, give us a little bit of the background. Tell us how this, this uh, story began for you. My dad was super active. He loved riding his bike and skiing. And we, I would, I snowboard, but we would get season passes together. And every day he would ride his bike at least 10 miles. And I know it, it sounds crazy, but he did. And so he was really active and it's, it was pretty weird to see him sick. And so I commuted to college about an hour and a half away from my home. And he had called me when I was driving home one day and he was sick and he needed to go to the doctor. Um, He couldn't figure out how to make a doctor's appointment. And that was really weird for him. He was super tech savvy, super independent. um, And So I drove straight to his house and we went to the urgent care and they wouldn't even let him come in. They just said, you need to go to the ER. And so we went to the ER. They said, you have pneumonia. Here's a Z-pack and sent us on our way. And then two Z-packs later, about a week and a half, um, his ankle began to swell and went to his primary physician and they sent him to um it's called it's like a an imaging specialist and he got a ct scan and they found a pulmonary embolism in his lung a blood clot as well as a blood clot in his ankle which led them to believe leukemia and so he was admitted into the hospital in our local hospital. And within 24 hours, he was airlifted to this uh, great big hospital about three hours away from our home. And I followed. And coronavirus was not in the equation yet. Now, to back up just a second, I, I, I was interested in this when I read it to the uh, urgent care didn't even want to see him. They wanted him to go to the hospital, but it was just because of the severity of, of his symptoms as opposed to coronavirus, or did they suspect COVID at that point? Right. So at that time, it was the end of February. So coronavirus was not even in our minds, especially uh-huh. Redding is a pretty small town up in Northern California. And um, he was really sick. He did not look good. It, I don't think coronavirus was on their mind. I think it was the severity of the symptoms. I see. Okay, so jump back ahead now. So uh, they're taking him in. Um, it sounds like they, they might be suspecting cancer at this point. Right, right. So um, I drove down to Sacramento where they flew him and basically they still think it's leukemia because of the blood clots and um, the first day went well and I show up to the hospital the next day and that's when the respiratory distress really begins. He began going downhill really quickly. Um, in, In the article, I... I'm pretty sure it it says it describes how how a whole team of doctors rushed into the room and, and they were just trying to keep him alive and I was just standing in the corner because he should have died that day but he didn't um, and so he they got him all 
back to normal. They got him some oxygen, some um, fever reducers, stuff like that. And they transferred him to the ICU just for precautionary measures. And the plan the next day was to go back to the oncology unit in the same hospital. So this, the, the night after he spent the night in the ICU, which would be a Sunday, um, I showed up to his hospital room around 7 a.m. And I said, good morning, dad. And he said, good morning. And that was when um, he stopped talking clearly and um, his, the whole right side of his face began to droop. Mm. And that was the first stroke that had happened. Um, there were several. And so from that point on, I was kicked out of his room. Um, and so that Sunday he had those strokes. He also went into a more severe respiratory distress and was put on a ventilator and sedated. And, oh God. And, and, and again, this is when is COVID in, in the picture yet? I mean, do, do they know what they're dealing with? You know, I don't think so. So that day would have been March 17th. And so COVID was starting to really show up in New York. Um, but schools hadn't shut down yet. Um, there were still kids going to school. Um, I was on spring break, so I didn't have school, which was, I was lucky because I was able to be with my dad. Um, but even then it, it, the tests weren't even available. And I, I think they still really believed it was the leukemia. Okay. So the reason I ask about the, the COVID diagnosis, I remember back in, you know, springtime, it might've been April. I'm not sure, but I interviewed Katie Ostad. She's uh, an ICU, uh, an ER nurse uh, down in Atlanta, Georgia. And she said the thing that was amazing to doctors and nurses early on was about the many different ways COVID would manifest itself. It could be any number of maladies uh, that were originally responsible for people to come in, come into the hospital, but then respiration would always become a, a a, a problem and people would think it was a respiratory problem but uh, since then my understanding is uh, coronavirus or COVID has been determined to be uh, very much heart related they even have a, a thing called COVID stri- stroke or uh, for heart ailments associated with COVID so uh, what your father was experiencing particularly out in Reading out in the western United States uh, probably was unique then but since then I don't think it is that unique any longer. Right. I agree. And since the time that he was in, in the hospital and even since he died, so much has come out that, you know, I look back and see like, wow, it, it was COVID the whole time. And it, it's very interesting just how that has happened, how he got sick and Nobody knew what it was until it was too late, you know? Well, they were reluctant to test, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, very reluctant. Well, there wasn't a lot of testing going on. Tests weren't easy to get. I mean, it, again, you got to think about the calendar and, and uh, the curve here as far as uh, the coronavirus is concerned. Um, early on, uh, they, they weren't doing tests. Uh, people didn't know what they were dealing with as well. And uh, times have changed, certainly. And so... You know, if you, I hate to just put you on the spot, but it, I, I think it's important for people to understand how this disease progresses and uh, how this uh, uh, comes uh, to an end, basically. So if you could uh, take us along now. Um, it, for a while, it sounds like you thought he was going to get better, but it just didn't happen. Right. So the day after he was put on a ventilator, um, they had done a bone marrow sample to look for the cancer and the bone marrow sample never came back and so even though that happened they began the first round of chemo and I was told by a healthcare professional at towards the end of my dad's life that 
the chemo probably prolonged his life, even if he didn't have cancer, because it suppressed his inflammatory response, which COVID produces an incredible inflammatory response. And so there's about a 10 day window from the start of chemo to the end. And he was doing well. He was breathing on his own. The ventilator was timing his breaths. So he took enough during the minute. Um, he was able, he wasn't on any blood pressure medications. He was on an antibiotic for precautionary measures. And things were going really well. They were doing tests to take him off the ventilator. There was great, there was hope. Um, and then, so not much had changed within those 10 days. There had been some theories about different kinds of infections that didn't happen, some theories about seizures, which was not true after testing. And then around 10 days after the chemo um, had started, they were going to take him off the ventilator. And so before they did that, they wanted to do another bone marrow sample to try to see if they could get enough to see anything. And they ended up, they weren't able to see anything. The sample wasn't good, they said. Um, just like the last one, they couldn't see anything. And so during that process, um, he just went extremely downhill. Um, his blood pressure dropped. He couldn't keep it up. Um, he couldn't breathe on his own anymore. Um, he was on the highest ventilator settings. Any thoughts about taking him off the vent was gone. Um, and it, they were really worried about his heart stopping. I think the fact that he was so active and strong before this really helped his heart work to keep him alive during this time period that he was on the ventilator. Um, but obviously, you know, it can only do so much. And so all of that happened as well as his kidney stopped working, his spleen stopped working, his liver stopped working. Um, My God. And then... You know, over the course of the of the uh, podcast now, we're looking at some photos here, and I want people to see this because uh, the thing that a lot of folks also think, uh, well, it's a hoax, it's not real or whatever, but these are people that have these pre-existing conditions. They're nursing home people. They're extremely elderly people. They're people that probably were going to die anyway. I mean, I know that's what people are thinking and saying. That's not the case, folks. This guy is in the peak of health. I mean, for a man his age, riding a bike, bicycle 10 miles a day. I mean, that strikes pretty close to home. I mean, that's about where I live. There's no reason for this guy to be dying. This is definitely COVID that's affecting his respiration, his inability to breathe, a man fighting for life because of the coronavirus. Now, um, Alex, I interviewed uh, Maureen Brady. She's become a friend of the podcast. She's a uh, nurse out in um, the, she was last at the Bronx is where she was going into work. And what she said, um, and she had worked through the, uh, AIDS, uh, epidemic, for instance, back in the eighties and nineties. And, 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 uh, she, I mean, she'd seen it all in a 40 year career, maybe longer. And what she said was, uh, they go on ventilators and, and, uh, uh, what the medical professionals were shocked by was some of these folks got better and survived. And some of them just didn't. And uh, she about wept when she was describing it because they not only uh, couldn't do anything for them, they didn't know what was happening, why some of them just couldn't get any better. And, of course, the point that she wanted to make to everybody, not only uh, did it strike people in the, in the prime of life that otherwise would have been healthy like your father, but some of these folks that she was working with out in the Bronx had to die alone. Now, uh, without getting in too much detail because i know it's hard for you um your father didn't have to die alone you were able to go in and see him but it it was a little different can you describe that right so um i 
it was a race to get there because they weren't sure if they could keep them alive, which I understood. Um, but they let me in after like a five hour battle, which I'm so grateful for. So grateful. Um, and I got to talk to him and see him and hold his hand um, for about 30 minutes. And then I was booted. But 30 minutes, I will take that over nothing. And I know how um, rare that is during these times. So I'm very gracious, grateful for that. Um, but he had a really great nurse who I had met in the weeks before and he he sat with my dad and held his hand as he passed and he told me that and I I'm just so grateful for for every healthcare worker but especially that that man he was just so kind to me and especially towards my dad at the final moments of his life uh, well, you know, that that's great to hear. And I really, again, I know this isn't easy, and I appreciate you sharing this uh, with our audience. And again, it, it not only gives it a sense of humanity, but it drives home the reality of this, which in, unless you are touched directly by it, a lot of people just seem to want to reject it or not. Uh, I don't know. Um, tell us tell us a little bit more about that angle now, um, what you've encountered since then. I uh, you know, I'm getting to be kind of an old dog, but um, even in your youth, uh, you've got to be somewhat shocked uh, by what you've encountered since then. I am shocked. Um, I've actually experienced the denial through not only friends, but also my dad's family. It's very interesting to see um, his cousins, not all of them, but certain ones have posted like, they don't think COVID's real. They think stuff like that. And that's, that sucks because he loved them. And, and my dad was, he believed in COVID when it was happening in China. He followed that and believed it. And um, he was smart. And I have also seen, well, here's an example my town shut down because of the pandemic because of our governor's orders, which I completely agree with. Um, unfortunately, my town's higher powers completely refused that. Restaurants remained open, bars remained open. If they had open seating inside when it was not supposed to, they publicly announced that they would not um, shut down the businesses and they, there are many, you would go into any grocery store, any church, no one's wearing masks. It's, it's crazy. And almost everyone I went to high school with is still partying. You know, this past Labor Day weekend, it's just so interesting seeing all these people get together. And I, I hope no one gets sick. But, you know, I think it something that I, I think is if COVID doesn't affect you personally, you, it's harder to believe, which I understand. I think that's a lot of... Um, situations another interesting thing is like i wish covid was fake you know don't we all right it's like i you know the comment i think i get most is i'm a sheeple um and it's like you know i i wish i was i wish that was the situation but unfortunately, you know, my dad's dead. So it's a, a, just, she, a, a sheeple. I, I got, yeah. Are not well, it's just hard to imagine. And uh, the point that I made at the opening of the show, even if you, uh, let's say you believe in it, but you think that it's a long shot, that it's not going to happen to you. Well, why would you risk a one in a thousand shot, let's say, 
uh, to do the types of things that I talked about at the beginning of the show or that Alex is talking about, you know, uh, going to a restaurant in a pandemic, not wearing a mask because it's uncomfortable in a pandemic. I mean, people need to become more aware and they need to become more aware quickly because of the calendar. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. The quarant- the uh, vaccine's not going to be here in October, regardless of what they say. Uh, and even if it is, most people aren't going to take it, they're telling us. I mean, we're still looking at months of this and the worst part of the calendar is yet to come. And I also wanted to mention this now, um, before we leave you, Alex, and again, I really appreciate you coming on here. Um, we framed this shot so that you've got that, uh, that painting, uh, above your head there of the, uh, the mountain. It sounds like you and your dad both love the mountains. Right. So this is Mount Shasta in Northern California. My dad was a huge, um, photographer just for fun. And this is actually a picture he took. Oh, and- had it made onto a canvas and I just love it. And this is where we would get our season passes and go snowboarding and skiing. So it's very special to me. And that was the last uh, great outing that you had with your dad. Right. It was that. And then um, he threw me my 21st birthday party. Oh, nice. My God, that's all well and good. Well, Again, good on you. I, I wish that I could undo everything that's happened to you, particularly with uh, your dad, Mark Neal. Uh, sounds like a great man. I struck down in the, in the prime of life. Folks, by the coronavirus, um, it can get each and every one of us. Nobody is immune. Um, what advice would you li- give us uh, here as we close up, Alex? What would you like to say in closing uh, before we end the podcast? COVID doesn't care who you are or what you believe in. And wash your hands and be nice to people and wear a mask. Yeah. That is the most important advice. And um, take care of your family. Take care of one another. uh, Love one another. Appreciate the time that you get because you never know when it's going to be taken away. Mm Mm-hmm. Alex, anytime you want to come back on podcast by George, share your thoughts. Let us know any updates, anything that's happening with you and your family or any feelings that you have about uh, the coronavirus or the news of the day. You let me know because uh, you're back on, kiddo. You're in our hearts and um, you're in our minds and I I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you for having me, George. Folks, that's Alexandra Neal. Alex Neal. 21 years old out of Redding, California, and she's um, very valiantly and and, uh, uh, very courageously agreed to come on podcast by George to tell her tale here in coronavirus and uh, the pandemic of 2020. I hope you like a podcast by George. And normally um, we have uh, happier topics to share with you, but sometimes the news is sad and it's things that you need to know. And this is where you can go. Podcast by George is on Facebook. Um, we're on YouTube, of course, and um, iTunes, um, all of the platforms where podcasts are seen or heard, but that's going to do it for this show. That's all there is. And there, there ain't no more this time. That's another podcast. Bye, George.